All right, good morning, everybody. From the dome to your home, uh, this is Reese Barrick. And i a little bit late, sorry about that. We were having, uh, had some questions about different things going on in the museum. And of course, I'm figuring out something fun to talk about today. So I, I ran across some things as I was walking through the museum. And you can see behind me here, we have a whole bunch of skulls of mammals. And I was looking at some things and remembering back and when I was in graduate school and I was working on trying to look up uh, our study, whether dinosaurs were warm-blooded or not. And there was some really interesting research done by some uh, different uh, researchers around the world and one of the things that they were researching that I thought was pretty cool was uh, nasal turbinates and you're wondering what the heck is a nasal turbinate I was wondering that too at the time um, but what they are are bones in your nose area that go back into your skull humans don't really have them but almost every mammal and many, most birds do. So I thought I would take a look at it and then we can talk about what makes them interesting and cool and important. <clears throat> All right, so let's see here. If I flip the camera around. All right, here are a few mammal, well, this one's not. Let's take a look at this one first. This is a turtle skull and if you look at the skull obviously you got your eyes go here and your nose is in here and you look deep inside the nose you see it's pretty clear you've got some bones and you've got ooh, some passages for air to go back down through to the lungs and it's a pretty nice clean passageway right um, if we can flip it, we can see the palate of the skull, and you can see the place where air passages come through the nostrils. Right here. And go back to the lungs, sort of showing how a turtle breathes, and very nice clear passages. All right, so that's a typical, what would be typical of reptilian skulls. And we know that most reptiles are what we call ectotherms or cold-blooded. So that simply means that their body temperature is dependent somewhat upon the environment. Um, and that basically their body temperature can um, go up and down uh, with the temperature of their environment. So that's kind of an interesting thing. And if we want to look at something different though, on the other extreme, we have mammals, all right? And mammals we know are warm-blooded or endotherms, which means they have a high metabolic rate and they keep their body temperature pretty constant all the time. So if we try to look through the nose of this particular cool animal, and this is simply a deer, and we see what's really kind of weird and funky. So we have all these bones right here and here. And they're sort of wrapped up and coiled up and they fill up the whole nose, essentially. So if this particular animal is going to breathe, all the air has got to go through all these chambers and passages created by these bones. And these bones are what are called nasal nose turbinates. So it's all these little sort of paper thin like um, bones that create this funky weird set of passages. And if you can follow all the way back up here, you can see more of them. So these little bones, air has got to go pass through them and pass through all of these cool funky chambers up here before they passes down into your lungs. Do all mammals have this? Darn.
darn near, just about, right? There's another view, and again, you can see there's sort of coiled up round and round chambers of fine bone that when an animal, when the mammal breathes through its nose, air has got to pass through all of these bones and all these little chambers. So it takes a while for the air to get through all of, all of that to get to the lungs. You can see it in just about everything. Here's a cool beaver. And if you look in there, look up its nose and you can see all these chambers. So these guys could never stick their finger up and smack into their brain. They run into all these different bones before they could do that. <laughs> Here's a cool little um, raccoon. And if you get up close, you can see, try to look up the nose, you can't see anything because there's just a huge network of fine little bones making up chambers where the air has got to get through when the animal breathes. So the question is, why is that important? Well, there's been, there used to be a number of suggestions, but because all mammals have it, we basically know that the earliest mammals had these bones. And one of the suggestions had been that, um, well, let's stop for a second. Why are these bones important? Well, they're important because what happens is in, um, when you're breathing in and out, if the air is a lot drier, especially if it's drier and colder, um, an animal wants to warm up their, um, the air before it gets into their lungs. They don't want to freeze their lungs. And the other thing is that if you um, are, are breathing out, everything in your lungs is very warm and moist. So you have a lot of moisture in your air. Um, you can tell every time you breathe out when you go out in the winter and you see your breath in the air, that's all moisture coming from your lungs that's being lost out into the air and creating this nice cloud of mist. So when you do that, you're actually drying out. So your lungs are drying out, you're, whole, you're losing water. And um, one of the things we don't want to do is lose moisture, lose water. Uh, we don't want to dry out too much. So one of the things that, one of the main things that these nasal turbinates are important for is that because the air has to go through all of these chambers on the way in and on the way out, coming back out this direction, that the air warms up on the way in and it gets some moisture in it before it hits the lungs. So it's not drying the lungs out on the way in. It's not freezing the lungs if it happens to be cold out. And then as air comes back out through the nose, what the other thing that it can do is that it will start cooling off, which will make, you know, when, when you cool off um, really moist air, you get droplets and it condenses. And so the moisture condenses and stays in the body. So the moisture isn't lost as the animal breathes out. So it's a pretty handy, handy dandy little thing um, for mammals and most birds to be able to do is to be able to warm up the air on the way in, cool it down and save water on the way out. Now this is kind of important because when you are going to be a warm-blooded animal with a really high metabolism, that means you're doing a lot of breathing in and out rapidly. You have, you're have a lot of energy and you want to keep your body temperature constant. So you want to not lose um, any moisture and you don't want to lose heat. So these turbinates become very important in conserving heat and water. If you're a cold blooded or low metabolic rate animal, that's not so important because your body temperature can change um, with the environment. You don't have a high metabolism. You can slow your breathing down if you're cooler. Um, 
than if you're warmer. And so you don't have as much need to worry about um, heat loss and moisture loss from your lungs while you're breathing. So there was researchers that said, guess what, we need to have, um, if animals do or don't have turbinates, it will tell you whether they were warm-blooded or cold-blooded. Um, and the fascinating thing is that most dinosaurs don't have any turbinates. And so they were suggesting that dinosaurs were definitely not warm-blooded other than the ones that became birds because most birds do have these turbinates. So it made it sort of a fascinating, interesting um, study. One of the things that is interesting about all of these turbinates as we look at them, so is that, as I mentioned, they're very thin and kind of paper-like, but they fill up the nostrils. But, um, so are they preserved in fossils? That's the interesting question. And so uh, oftentimes they're not. But a lot of times when we get skulls, we have complete skulls, and so we don't necessarily see inside of them very well. Or if we do, a lot of times those bones, as we're prepping up the fossil, those paper-thin bones may not be preserved. Here's a couple interesting fossil examples. This is a, a skull of basically a fossil um, muskox. It's a genus called Ovibos. It just came in. Somebody brought it into the museum uh, just before our quarantine time. And if you look at this guy, you can see his, this is looking inside the skull. Here's his horn. And this horn got cut off a little bit here. This is looking inside his nose. Let's get a little bit of light, maybe a little bit better. And you can see, certainly, there's a lot of these little chambers of bone, fairly thin bone, on either side of what would be the nasal passage, right? And yes, uh, do you know musk ox are closely related to goats? That is true. So they're not really oxen, they're not, they're not related to to bison or cows, they are definitely more closely related to goats, very big furry goats. Um, but they do have nasal turbinates. And it also really makes sense because these guys are living in where it's very cold and dry. So they definitely want to be warming up the air that they're breathing. Mm -hmm. This is an even older fossil, and it's kind of interesting. Here's a tooth. Right? And you can see the tooth with the root that goes up into the skull. This is a tooth of a rhino called Teleoceros. And I bring it in because as you look at any mammal skull here, you see the teeth and they go right up into the skull. So the turbinates are basically resting right above where the teeth are. So if we look at this tooth and flip over, we got a little bit of the skull and if you look at the skull, you can again see all of these thin bones with a whole bunch of little chambers that would have been inside the skull, all right? So air would have been breathing in this way, coming in, it's gotta go through all of these little chambers before going back down into the lungs. So occasionally we can get turbinates actually found in fossils and just for the fun of it I thought maybe I'd take a little walk because there's one cool fossil that I can definitely not carry very far but it's really kind of the most magnificent thing in that sometimes when you find fossils that don't seem to be well preserved they get beat up quite a bit they can still have all kinds of cool information in them. And this is one particular one that I really kind of like. Uh, there was a mammoth that was uh, collected, I'm not sure if it was the 90s, in, from Pratt. And it is beat up to all kingdom come. So here is the parts of the skull. You can see we've got 
a cool tooth here. Another part of the jaw with a tooth here. There's the front part. And you can actually see some bits of tusk that bro broken up here. But if we look at the flip side over here, here's the top of the skull, All right? Poor thing looks like it's beat up pretty bad. Up here is where you're gonna have some tusks coming out, but right here, this is what's cool. Now we're looking back inside the nasal passages. Now look at this, catacombs. It's like a, a, a honeybee nest full of these chambers. And it's just, they're all over. So if you look at this, and it goes very extensive. So you think of this animal breathing, and the air's got to pass through all of these chambers on its way to the lungs, and it's on its way out from the lungs. Mammoths are really, really large animals, and they really don't, you know, they're living in a pretty dry and cool climate. So they have a real need to warm up the air on their way to their lungs and to can save water on the way out. So this is, while it's a beat up specimen, the fact that we can look inside the skull, I think is, gives us a fascinating insight to seeing how animals breathe. Um, so I particularly like this, this specimen, maybe more than other people might, but I think we need to save it because this is just really cool. So, um, important part, uh, you know, a lot of times in, with fossils and things, we're looking at their legs, we're looking at their jaws and teeth to look at how they ate and how they walked around. This is cool because it gives us an idea of exactly what it takes to breathe and how this affects their whole lifestyle um, and whether they can have a really high metabolism or not. So anyway, let's see. What animal is this from? This is a mammoth. Um, so this is a skull of a mammoth. And you can see the cool mammoth teeth here that have the, the typical ridges going back and forth for a nice grazer. <laughs> All right, we'll sneak back. And we just wanna reiterate that Snakes, turtles, lizards don't have turbinates. Uh, mammals and birds do. And some of the earliest mammals and pre uh, synapsids even, if you go back to the Permian before we act, they were actually mammals yet, you can see some almost beginnings of the evolution of turbinates. Um, but all mammals have them and the ones that have the least developed turbinates? Humans. We have such short noses, we don't have... Um, dun, 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 dun. We don't have long noses like these guys where we can fit lots of bones in to make turbinates to help our breathing. So as humans, we don't do a very good job of that and that's why when it gets really cold and dry out, you see us wrapping ourselves with um, masks or scarves or things to sort of help keep ourselves from freezing our um, freezing our lungs or losing too much water. So um, yes, turbinates have been postulated as being indicative of warm-blooded and yes, pretty much warm-blooded things today all have them and cold-blooded things don't or ectothermic things don't. Um, and that gets us, you know, into questions of looking at dinosaurs because dinosaurs are fascinating because when you've studied dinosaurs, we figured out that they pretty much keep a constant body temperature, which is endothermic, but they don't have turbinates. Although their most recent ancestors, um, birds, modern ornithurine is what we call them, birds, all do have them. So more interesting, fun 
puzzles and things for us to try to figure out um, going forward and figuring out the history of life on Earth, which is always a fun puzzle and mystery to try to put together. Mm -mm -mm. So just this is just a, a cool place and we can look at the skulls, but it, it's the things that we don't see when we're looking at our cool mammals that have not been prepared all the way. But yet inside all of these very cute, fun little faces and their nice noses here, we can now think um, inside there, there is a whole world of uh, cool chambers and canals that air has to get through once it goes in the nose before it has a chance to get back to the lungs. So anyway, that's just sort of the fun little thing to talk about today. Think about the fact that um, when we say warm-blooded or cold-blooded, endothermic or ectothermic, we're really thinking about temperature and metabolism, but sometimes we don't think about all that goes in to being a high metabolic rate animal. And breathing is a big part of that. And conservation of water and temperature is all very important. And nasal turbinates seem to be an interesting, cool piece about that. So anyway, if we don't have a whole lot of other questions, I just wanted to give you a, a sort of a, a peek inside a mammal skull and why it's important. So I think pretty much we'll probably call this a day. And I know that Ian is going to be coming and talking to everyone this afternoon and he's going to start talking about basically the Sternberg legacy. Uh, some of the, each of the different Sternbergs and how they were important to paleontology, the history of Kansas, and, um, and paleontology uh, in general. So I'm really looking forward to that. I think that will be a whole lot of fun. So from the dome, um, give us some likes, give us uh, some follows, and we'll see you here this afternoon. Have a great morning and beginning of your day. Thanks, bye.